Welcome to another episode of Investing in Intellectual Property with Dave. Today we have a very special guest with us. This gentleman is one head of the two-headed monster that owns and operates the successful coffee franchise, Big B Coffee, which does over $250 million in annual sales a year and has over 300 stores nationwide. Please help me welcome Mike McFaul. How's it going, Mike? Good, day. Thanks for having me. Oh, this for exciting. sure. Uh, this is going to be a pretty good one. Uh, I, 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 I have to tell you, Big B Coffee, and I'm not really a big coffee drinker, but Big B Coffee is what made me fall in love with coffee. And this was back in my uh, my Michigan State days in undergrad. This was the first time that I you know, went to a coffee store, and I've kind of been to the local coffee uh, stores and uh, you know, the competitors of Starbucks and things like that. But when I went into Big B, everybody was just so happy. And for whatever reason, that <laughs> blew me away. Yeah. And it was like not even just one store. It was like, okay, if I go to the store in East Lansing, it was that. If I go to a store in Lansing, it was that. It was consistent across the board. And for whatever reason, I that concept was so new and novel. And even today, it still is to a certain extent. You go to Chick-fil-A, and I, I, I guess I get that at Chick-fil-A. But otherwise, it's not too many stores that or restaurants that I go into and the staff is happy. The staff is pleasant. The staff is caring. And uh, I, I've been hooked on uh, Big B Coffee ever since. Uh, so well, I, I guess I had to tell you that story of kind of how I fell in love with the uh, Big B Coffee as my go-to coffee. And I, I try to get it at least two times a week. I'm not sure if that's uh, if that's ideal or not, but I guess that's kind of where I met with things at this point. Well, you know what ideal would be. Oh, right. a, day. <laughs> a couple times a day well, I, uh, yeah but I, I i love this podcast because the the uh the background makes me feel right at home you know with, yeah. with the uh with the sparty up there and the jersey it's like <laughs> it's like it's like coming home you know i love it absolutely and those were the glory days for me playing at michigan state uh back in undergrad and and we had some good years then uh we're, we're still trying to get back there uh there now, but uh, at least back when I played, we man, we had some good times in East Lansing. Uh, I, I I had to ask you this question: What made you start like, the coffee franchise? Because a lot of times, I, I'm not sure. If, kind of growing up, that was always like the, the thing of okay, I want I'm, one day I'm gonna start a coffee franchise. It seems like that may be different compared to okay, I'm gonna start a clothing company or a technology company. Was that always, I guess, your goal to start a uh, a coffee company at, at some point? No, no, it, you know, so. The, the, how I ended up in the coffee business, it's a little bit of a, of a windy path. I, I worked at our first store as a barista. So oh. I was, at, I was at the university working on a very specific research project in preparation to go back to graduate school. I was 20, I think I was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And I, I took, took a job at, at our, at their, our very first store. We had one store at that point, uh, you know, working 6 AM till 2 PM every day in the coffee shop. And, you know, then at that point, the long story short is I began to sense a real opportunity. Um, I, my, my business partner, Bob Fish, uh, and, and Mary Roselle, uh, his partner that he started that first store with, um, you know, they were doing things very, very differently in coffee. Mm. And, and so, and, and then it didn't take a rocket scientist to see the opportunity coming at us in coffee. You know, it, it, it was so, so when he approached me about becoming a, a manager uh, of his second store, um, we ended up, you know, in a very long conversation uh, and we settled on, <laughs> sounds crazy now, but we went for a four hour walk around East Lansing one afternoon. We were supposed, he was supposed to be interviewing me for like the assistant manager's job at the second store. We went for like a four hour walk around East Lansing. At the end of that walk, we shook hands. We formed a new company that he would own a third of, I would own a third of, and Mary would own a third of. And, uh, and that company would be the company that we'd utilize to grow big b coffee and so that's it and and i i uh, resigned my position at the university and i jumped in full steam on on uh, big b i became the manager assistant manager of store one and then when store two opened i was a general manager of store two and and then the rest is history we've been growing it ever since uh we bought mary out in 2012 uh mm -hmm. and so gosh going on 12 years of, of that that's amazing uh and, and so that's how i got into the coffee business and it really wasn't this i really enjoyed working there you know, that was, that was one of the keys is I, I really enjoyed being a barista and working in a store. And, and then from there, you know, like I said, it didn't take a rocket scientist to see the opportunity. And, uh, I, I locked in and we've been doing it now for 20, 28 years. So how, how much of a, uh, 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 did you have to convince? Cause again, I think I, and we'll talk about both of the book grind as well as your recent one grow. And I think that 
know, coming out, I'm not sure if it was uh before you went to grad school, you seemed like you were making some decent money uh coming out. I think you were saying that what in 93, coming out straight out of college, 100 k I'm not sure if that was before that time or not. Uh, but how how difficult was it to convince your parents or just <laughs> loved ones, people who are kind of giving you advice and pouring into you to go to grad school to say, hey, not only am I going to give up grad school, but I'm going to give up grad school to start a coffee business. Well, that's I mean, I give my parents a lot of credit. Uh, you know, they 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 never said a word. They were supportive all the whole time. Um, really? You know, I was very, very fortunate as a as a kid to have my parents uh put me through college, you know, uh, I was on a full scholarship, the mom and dad scholarship. So, you know, they, they, they were really, um, invested in me and, and, in my brother's, uh, education. And, you know, and then when I, when I got into the coffee business, they were just supportive, you know, I, mm. and, and I really, I mean, that's pretty incredible when I look back on it. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, I'd had a, a straight commission sales job, um, down in Houston, Texas for my first year and a half out of undergrad before Big B, right before Big B. And that was the, that was the, um, you know, I learned a ton, you know, the straight commission sales is a beast and an animal all in and of itself, you know? And so anyway, yeah. And, 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 uh, uh, and then my parents were, were really good to me, you know, they really were, it was amazing. Nice, nice. No, that's cool. So then I, I guess, what did you see in Bob Fish? Cause I, your, your, your partner, because it, it, it seems like these days, that's one of the big things when you're starting a company is, okay, am I going to have a partner? And I guess when you do decide to have a partner, just kind of making sure you vet them and, okay, did you go from, he, he's uh cause I, I know you are, he, you guys are different in many ways where he's more of a, uh, a, at least back then grinder, 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 working 20 hours a day, things like that. And your, your approach is completely different where, Hey, I'm not working weekends. I'm not working 12, 16 hour days. Uh, but, but again, you, you do also, uh, uh, uh you know, mention him as being, uh, you know, just a person of integrity, a person of character and things like that. So I guess what back then did you see in your partner, uh, to, to, to make you think, okay, this is, this is someone I want to go into business with, because I think that's a big thing, uh, you're going in a business with with people and making sure that these people are 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 good people well you know um one we both took a really really long vantage point on the business mm. so and second the first you know i worked for him uh you know originally uh he owned the store i worked for him even when we set up the new company I mean, the new company was nothing for a long time, you know, and, and so, you know, he, he, I looked at him as a mentor and someone who was teaching me the business, right? Teaching. I wasn't in the restaurant business. He came out of the restaurant business. He was very, very, very good at it. Right. And so I just looked at him and he taught me everything I know about being in the, in the, in the retail restaurant space, food service. And, and so, but I also brought some very different kinds of skills yeah. and capabilities that, that he, that he didn't, you know, that, that weren't his strong suits. Uh, and so, you know, we, we complement each other very, very well. And, and I think, you know, that you said something in there in passing, but it's really important that, you know, we both been highly focused and committed to the relationship in making sure that the relationship works. Hmm. And, and so, you know, it, and we still do today, right? So, so it's, it's important that we, you know, for example, I, I, I wrote these books and, and, you know, my, you know, so I had an attorney advising me on the contract with the publisher and so on. And, and I had set these books up as an asset inside of Global Orange, which is the company that owns the intellectual property for Bigby. Right. And he's like, well, why would you do that? This is your work, right? It's like your own individual personalized work. It's like, well, yeah, but I mean, so my partner owns half of everything that I've done in terms of the assets of my books and my writing and my speaking and, and so on, right? He owns half that because we're 50, 50 in that company. Right. But my point was if I don't have him and I don't have that company, I've not, I don't have any ability to write a book. Yep. You know, and so I I see that that he owns half of the intellectual property of these books and so on. And so that's why, you know, that's why we set it up that way. But that's also and he does. He thinks the very same way. And that's why the relationship works, because we're always focused on what's fair, what's reasonable. You know, and we're not looking out for necessarily ourselves 
uh, as the you know the most important piece you know that it it's just <laughs> it's like relationships 101 you know like it's not complicated stuff dave you know that you just you just gotta you know be good to people be you know we're good to each other we take care of each other and so on but but what i guess because that seems so simple and straightforward and again it's not it's not rocket science but it seems like that's just not the norm uh again people it's almost like these humans just naturally for whatever reason have this tendency to try to Kind of this self-serving where I need to get the most out of the relationship as opposed to, OK, let's focus on the relationship and grow the relationship and kind of things will work out the way they need to. Uh, because yeah, that's just, I mean, that, that's amazing for you to say, hey, no, we, we kind of I, I wouldn't be here without if it weren't, weren't for you. So everything that you know, from an IP standpoint or whatever, we're going to split 50 50. But it is also big for him to say, hey, but this is kind of your work. So uh, I guess why would you, you know? But, but it's, it's, it almost shows how much he cares about, hey, I, I want you to kind of get everything that is deserving to you and and, yeah. and you understanding that, hey, no, I'm, I wouldn't be here without an opportunity that you gave me. And that, that, that's a beautiful thing, but it seems like that's kind of uh, not the norm or, uh, you know, far from the norm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I work and I do a lot of speaking around how to function inside of organizations and, and try to develop, you know, higher performing teams and and so on and i mean being an athlete and a high level athlete you understand as good as well as anyone that the high performing teams are the teams that have the strongest relationships period if you don't have good strong relationships and then where do those relationships start you know they start from the coaching staff from the leadership from the captains right and so like that's my whole point in when i go out and speak in the world is that when you are the leader you're responsible for facilitating an environment where people have good strong healthy relationships on your teams and if you do that then you've got then you're you're at least in the blocks to be able to build a high performing team have you and i know it's been a long time Go since where you are today. What was the original goals of Bibby? Was it hey, let's get a few stores and just run them and operate them? Because today you guys are kind of turning into this behemoth uh, <laughs> uh, after so many years. But did you have you guys ever envisioned this to say, man, we would have, I would have never thought that we would have made it this far. What were some of those goals at the beginning? Because I'm pretty sure they weren't, or were they grand? As 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 as, as we all may have think, we're going to one day have hundreds of stores and do hundreds of millions of dollars in annual revenue. Was that always the goal or did it just kind of morph into that? Well, you know, um, you know, first of all, it doesn't feel like a behemoth to us. Right. And so, you know, it's 28 years of building this thing and it's been, it's been very incremental, you know? And, and so, yeah, if, if we went from 10 to, you know, 380 stores, they would have felt like a behemoth, but you know, it doesn't feel like that to us. It feels like, um, it still feels like the same company it was 15 or 20 years ago. Right. And, and sure it's bigger, but it's all built on the same things, you know, the same principles and so on. Uh, and, and so to answer the other question about, we always had really grand visions. We mm. really did. Uh, and, and I think it's a big part of why we're able to grow it to this point where we are now, you know, and had we had a vision of being, you know, 15 stores in, in the greater Lansing area, which would be great yeah, in so many <laughs> regards, like you, you know, you could support your family and build a nice life with 15 stores in, in, uh, in but, but for whatever reason for Bob and I, it's, it's the, the growth is, uh, is is what's exciting and you know i had a i had a student who came up to me um last semester i teach here at the university of ann arbor and and uh they won't go mentioned on this podcast but uh <laughs> but the the uh and she came up to me and she said why are entrepreneurs so obsessed with growth like why is it that every entrepreneur you know growth is is everything it seems and it took me back you know i didn't really have an answer and and i went and i came back to her at the next class period. And I said, you know, I think I've got a, I've got a pretty good answer for you. Mm -hmm. I said, growth isn't the goal for most entrepreneurs, improvement and getting better is the goal. And that's what they obsess over. And growth is a, is a, a subset of that or growth is a 
byproduct of it maybe by, thank you a byproduct of that right and so yeah growth is kind of how you measure whether you're getting better whether you're improving and and so that's why we obsessed with growth and i think that's a big part of what bob and i have done over the years is we've been pretty darn obsessed with getting better at doing this business and I improving see. and and so on now did you guys always uh have this goal to obsess over the customer because again I, as i was saying at the beginning even still like I was an undergrad back in 2000 and what, what eight and eight, 2009 at Michigan State. And even, you know, fast forward until present day, uh, again, when I go into the, the big B locations to, to get something to drink, it's always this kind of caring approach, this, this kind of happy, energetic, positive vibe, which again, if I go to, I'm not going to name other restaurants, but if you go to other restaurants, it's almost a, like they're doing me a favor to take my money, which is always just kind of blowing me away. So did you guys from the beginning, has to have this approach of and we need to make sure the because you talk about it in your book as far as the customer experience making sure that's make the customer experience perfect so was that always a goal at the beginning or an objective or something you kind of you guys noticed as time went on no i mean that's that's why i'm here is because you know i mean i could i could i could take an hour to explain how we do that to you so that's not by accident and and we're it's very deliberate around mm. engaging the employee engaging the barista in a way that they that they are interested in and inspired to bring that to the customer uh and it's one of the biggest challenges any business owner faces any retailer faces it's one of the biggest challenges right and so and we do that better than than anyone in my opinion and so that's the that is the magic of Big B Coffee, and that is why, in my opinion, the systems we have in place that yeah. that that help support that behavior are the most important systems in our business. And it's really truly what we've built this company on. Well, well, why don't you think that other companies kind of take that approach? Because again, when you look at the successful companies, the Big Bs, and even though you know Chick Fil A is kind of is. is Kind of different even though they're in the restaurant industry they kind of still have a similar model uh where like you go to chick-fil-a and people are smiling it's just like this stuff is not rocket science why don't you think other restaurants take a, a, a page from that playbook i don't think people who manage others i don't think people who own businesses and manage others understand the importance of putting together programs and systems that support the employee and having the ability to do that. And so that's very, to me, counterintuitive to most people. And so when somebody will say, you know, I talk to, I talk to business owners all the time, like we provide, you know, we, we provide really good, strong customer service. You hear that line. Anytime you talk to it, we're really, we really, we really focus on service. I want to say how, how, how do you do it? Tell me right now how you do that. Now, Dave, if you were asked to ask me, Mike, how does Bigby do it? I've got a full blown hour long presentation, mm -hmm. every detail exactly developed in terms of how we do that. And so that, I, I don't know why other people don't understand some of this stuff. It's all out there. It's all out there, right? <laughs> like you don't have to be a rocket scientist to go figure this stuff out, yeah. but they don't. And, and I don't know why. Uh, and, and, and the other thing, the other thing, and you know, this is, this is like the stuff I'm super passionate about. Right. But the other thing is that everybody talks about trying to find good people. It's not about finding good people. You're so far off the mark. If you're using mm -hmm. that language, what you need to do as a leader is create an environment that unlocks people and allows them to be amazing. They want to be amazing. Everybody wants to be amazing, you know, and it's our job as leaders to create that environment for them where they can be amazing. But nobody looks at it that way. You know who looks at it that way? Like championship that? coaches, championship coaches, right? You, you, you listen to some of these coaches talk man i mean i know it's it's not near and dear to your heart right now but jim harbaugh man he did you hear the interview he did right after beating Al, i think it was 
anyway, I think it was in the, right before the, the championship game. So the yeah, Alabama. Game, he Alabama. talked about, uh, the reporter came up to him and said, Jim, I've noticed you've talked to three three players in the last, you know, since I uh, when you were standing. He goes, every one of them, you walked up to me and you said, I love you. Yeah. To every one of them, you know? And so Jim Harbaugh created this culture where these guys would, you know, die for each other. And you know that I'm sure that was going on on your yep. teams that were championship teams, you know? And, and so like that's coaches understand that and why we as leaders don't take that approach to our teams. I don't know. I just don't know. Oh, and <clears throat> excuse me, I, that's, that's actually interesting because I think as coaches, I mean, and I'm just guessing here, I think as coaches, they understand that, Hey, I have this team for a defined period. This is not a team that I have forever. So let me try to maximize this team to get the most out of them, knowing that next year the coach is going to be different, the players are going to be different, so things are going to be different. So let's enjoy this moment. Let's let me let's work together. Let's try to achieve this goal or whatever it is. But they it's almost like this understanding that this is not forever. Whereas a lot of times it seems like when you're in maybe corporate America or in these kind of business settings, it's this thing of let me try to hold on to this person forever. And I guess you take a, a interesting approach, which is kind of different from traditional corporate America and is more aligned or akin with the, 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 the coaching approach where you're trying to get the best people for the job. And you're, and again, the second book was about this, the growth book where you're talking about uh trying to put people in a position where they can, 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 can thrive and, Hey, if it's not here, then it can be somewhere else. And if they do go somewhere else, then they're going to say good things about our company, which is a, a win-win situation. And we know that the people here, they actually want to be here. And uh, so it seems like kind of you're taking that approach from a coaching standpoint and understanding that, hey, just because he's a good person, that, that doesn't even necessarily mean that he is a good person or she's a good person for our team. Because right. it, it, it may not be the case. It's kind of based on, okay, does their goals align with our goals? And and all that does that make sense? Because it seems like as you're talking that out and kind of me reading the growth book particularly, it seems like that kind of yeah, your your kind of your mindset is more along with the coaches as opposed to in team sports as opposed to just a traditional corporate America where they're trying to just get good talent, although that good talent may not be a good fit for their organization. And and I love by the way, I love that. Like I'm gonna use that some of that, <laughs> but and. Every team in corporate America should have its championship it's going for. Yeah. Okay. It's not as dramatic as a national championship right. or a Super Bowl, but yep. I mean, every team should have its thing it's going for. Right. So we should create that. And then also to think that your people aren't fluid and aren't going to be changing. And are like, that's, that's like, I don't know, man, you, you, you should be managing back in, you know, 1955. Yep. If you think that people, so, so, I like the perspective that your people are volunteering for you. Mm. If you've created a strong dynamic team, you've got good people on your team. They can go get a job tomorrow anywhere else. Right? So they choose, they wake up and they choose to come work for you. Right. And that's a, that's a volunteer position in my mind. Mm. And how would you treat them if they were volunteering their time with you? You know, you would treat them very, very differently or most, most, managers leaders would treat their people very very differently if they were volunteering their time so you know that's also another perspective on on employing people and you know i i uh i love the i do love the analogy be, between high performing sports teams yeah. and corporate america i mean and and some people will say there's a big difference between you know some kid who's on a full ride at michigan state than the average person Okay. I mean, fair. <laughs> I get that. But, but at the same time, uh, there's still people, right. And, and they're still driven, I think by a lot of the same stuff, yep. you know? Uh, and so that, that to me, that, that there's some merit to that argument, but you know, at the same time, people are people and we're all, we're all kind of doing the same things out there, whether we're playing football at Michigan state or we're, yep. you know, working at Big B coffee. No, and, and I, I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Uh, so, with what, what's the, at this point in time with with Big B Coffee, I, what do you think would be, I guess, the the goal, the long term goal? Because in you know, at this point, it, it seems like you have evolved uh, from to the standpoint of maybe trying to 
not remove yourself, but hey, things are functioning and, and, and operating really kind of without maybe me and your partner, Bob, just kind of being in a day to day space, which I, I would say that's the goal of every entrepreneur. Uh, so I guess it's the goal to maybe get to a certain amount of, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain amount of stores or I guess revenue and then maybe look to sell or is it to kind of kind of be the, the next biggest thing uh, on a block uh, w- w- within a space? Uh, I know yeah, at yeah. one point, you no, know, before Fred DeLuca, you no, know, rest his so uh, the founder of Subway, he he at one point was kind of maybe looking to get fifty percent of it back, way back in the day. So I I guess what's the is that maybe a goal to maybe sell or is it you no? Know, we're gonna keep going with this thing. We're we're not gonna sell. Uh, everybody everybody knows that in our organization. Okay. Um, and you know we have very specific designs around what we're gonna do. Uh, with the, it, it, you know, I say very specific designs. We, I should say, we have very specific ideas. Uh, they aren't designed yet uh, because some of the stuff we want to do doesn't really exist in the world yet. Um, and so, one of the things that we're working on is, yeah, I this this concept, the stuff that we're talking about. My books, we've we've got an entity called Life Lab. It's the Life You Love Laboratory, and it's a it's it's about the purpose around life lab is to improve workplace culture in the United States and 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 get organizations focused on human centric leadership mm-hmm. and and that we as leaders in any organization need to be focused on developing the whole human being uh and then my my business partner is very very focused on the uh, farm direct business model Okay. Uh, through his work in in one big island in space, and so the the we're we're moving in the direction of leaving this asset that we've created to foundations that support that work, hmm. and and it's it's you know we haven't really gone we're not going overtly public with it because yeah. you know we really need to figure out how the heck we're going to do it and right. but you know we're both of the mindset that we're not passing multi generational wealth down. Uh, and we're not passing wealth down at all. And, 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 you know, my kids are, they got, my kids have every advantage to go do whatever they want to do in the world. And, uh, but they're not going to get any money. Right. Mm. Uh, and so they, they got to go, they got to go fend for themselves. They got to go, you know, figure it out. And that when you work within Big B Coffee, you know, that the value you're creating is going to end up in these two foundations yeah. that support these two ideas. And that's how we want to impact the world, and that's really what it's about for us. Wow, wow! So, uh, have any of your children try to come to you and say, "Hey, hey, 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 pops, uh, <laughs> can I get at least a million dollars or something uh, at the end of this thing?" Were, were they upset when you kind of broke that down to them, or they just understood and was like, "Okay, I'm a, it's gonna be okay because I'm gonna kind of find a way or kind of make a way as I'm kind of uh, matriculating through life." Yeah, I, I got I got some hardcore opinions on that stuff and they know it, you know, and it's and it's like, listen, I don't I don't want my kids to get to 50 years old yeah. and have something, whatever it is, and have it have really anything to do with me, mm-hmm. whatever they do, good or bad. I think I want it to be theirs. Mm-hmm. And and that's a big part of this for me is that, you know, if I give them, you know, two million bucks or whatever, are they always going to wonder? if what they were able to do in the world was because they started with 2 million bucks or could they have made something if they didn't have that? And I have enough confidence in my kids that they're going to kick ass in the world. I I don't, you know what I mean? Like I'm not worried about them. And so that's, that's what, that's the energy I want them feeling is this energy that I have all the confidence in the world in them and that they're going to go into the world and they're going to be great at whatever they choose to do, whatever they're passionate about, they're going to be great at it. And, and that's the, that's the energy I want them feeling from, from me and, and their mother, you know? Uh, so that's, uh, and it's a somewhat unconventional, you yeah. know? Um, I think a lot of times wealth is power. And so a lot of families don't want to give up power. Uh, and so they want to, they want to keep the wealth uh, tight. You know, because yeah. then it makes makes them and then makes their chi- kids and then makes their grandkids powerful in the world. And um, that's not my MO in the world. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be powerful. I'm not trying to, you know, I, I'm trying to improve the world. I'm trying to right. make it better. So, so so what about, I guess, the competing 
thing of, okay, like you said, with money comes power and kind of we all know what that, I guess, can turn into, I guess, on the other end of the spectrum. And this is maybe the polar opposite end where if you don't have money or you know, a pauper or whatever the case may be, then you start to kind of do some things that maybe are against your nature as a, as a, as a means to survive, which it, it almost is different, but it's almost kind of can 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 bring out some of the same things as far as this these these i guess these actions that are maybe undesirable i guess in the person if that makes sense yeah yeah i, I mean I, I know like i mean i live in the space that i i've lived a very privileged life you know and i don't, I don't know what it's like to to struggle really you know i mean i got a i got a i got a nice college degree given to me and you know i got I was employed right out of college and i did did well and so you know I, um so i don't i don't know like there's part of me that 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 um I've, I've had people comment to me like listen you want me to worry about building love in the workplace i can't even buy diapers for my baby <laughs> You know what I mean? I can't even buy diapers for my baby. And you want me worrying about building a loving workplace. I just need some money. I just need to make 22 bucks an hour to be able to put diapers on my baby. You know, I can't do that at $12 an hour or whatever. And so, yeah, I, I'm aware of that. And I don't, I don't, I'm doing the best I can, you know, like I really, I'm really, I'm, I really believe that if we can create high powered teams in the world, in organizations and companies that those organizations and companies will do better and better and better and will yeah. provide more opportunity for more people that are healthy environments, you know, uh, and aren't ruthless environments where we can afford to pay people what, you know, whatever the living wage is, you know, uh, at that point in time, uh, everybody talks about the living wage being this. And then I'm like, yeah, well, it is that today, <laughs> but it yeah. wasn't that 15 years ago and it's not going to be that in 15 years. I mean, right. whatever the living, whatever people need, to live a reasonable life is the living wage and where they live. So, you know, that's, that's my goal. That's what I'm up to. Uh, and you know, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing the best we can. I mean, we're grinding, man, we're, we're working hard trying to create all this stuff and it's, it's powerful. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I don't know if it's right, but it's what we're trying to create. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's one of those things where we're all kind of going through life and kind of doing what we believe is best. And the unfortunate part is we're, we probably won't find out that in our lifetimes. It yeah. maybe be long after we're kind of gone and until things come into fruition of whether or not we did or didn't do was the right thing or the wrong thing, which is, uh, I think, interesting in and of itself. Uh, I guess maybe switching gears a little bit. And we talked about this a little bit beforehand as far as IP, the importance of IP as it relates to the business uh, and, and, and starting and growing Big B Coffee. Uh, at what point did you guys understand, OK, intellectual property uh, is important for the, the, the lifeblood of the business and we need to kind of take the necessary steps to protect this? Well, you know, we I'm not exactly sure how we figured that out, but we figured it out pretty early uh, yeah. that 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 differentiating the intellectual property from the operating company was really important. Um, and that it gives you that in the end, it gives you a lot of protection, but also a lot of flexibility too, you know? And so, because the asset that's the intellectual property, I mean, it's, it's a big part of, of what you own when you own a, a company in the brand. I mean, remember when, when all the car companies were going through bankruptcy for was for just leveraged their, their, IP. their, their logo. They just leveraged the, the the logo and said, you know, we're, I, I don't know how much they borrowed, but uh, and they use it as collateral. And it, you know, they didn't have to borrow; they didn't have to borrow anything from the from the taxpayers. Uh, and so that's how powerful that stuff is, you know. And uh, and and we set our company up early, um, differentiating all the intellectual property inside of a separate entity uh, that really has very big, very big wall in between it and the other company. Yeah. And as long as we don't do anything negligent or inappropriate the, the intellectual property is safe uh from uh from um you know judgments or whatever in the world you know L legal judgments i mean right and and so I, I i that's the way i look at it so so we got that done pretty early and we've been riding it ever since i think one of the things that's been really important and somehow we figured it out is that being consistent with how you treat your intellectual property 
makes your intellectual property more valid, Mm -hmm. right? And more powerful. And so we set our company up with this structure where the operating entity paid 10% of its revenue to the intellectual, the company that owns the intellectual property. And we set that up. I mean, I think we set that up in 1998 that way or maybe 99, you know, so we've been doing it that way a long time and we've never changed it. And so now it's like, that's just, that's just what we value the intellectual property at. And, and, and there's a couple other things we do that way too. Um, and so, you know, I think that I know if you're starting a company, like you're worried about so many different kinds of things, but there's some real simple stuff you can do early that can really help you down the road in terms of, of having some flexibility around the assets that you have. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure like, you, you do, do you deal with a lot of patents and so on? And I mean, that stuff is like crazy powerful. I'm just talking about trademarking is all I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, patents is a whole different, whole different thing. So, so, so I, I guess, what, what would you say, where does IP fall in that spectrum? Because then again, in a book grind, you're, you know, you're grinding, you're just trying to get to uh, cash flow, uh, profitability, and then in growth, you're kind of more so trying to get to sustainability where things are, you you are profitable and kind of you're all maybe more or less hitting on all cylinders. So as you are starting a company, I guess in your opinion, or kind of where should this whole IP, protecting IP, thinking about the IP, if at all, should, where, where at what point should you start thinking about that? Should be should that be after you get to profitability or, you know, you start cash flowing or should you look to try to get that stuff set up uh from your perspective at the beginning before you kind of get going with everything because again like you said it's a lot going on at the beginning and more times than not as the owner or whatever the case may be you're wearing a lot of different hats uh so it can be uh to in a, in, to, in a sense overwhelming to try to think about all these things but it's still all these things are important stuff protecting the ip cash flow these are all important parts yeah. of the business i think it, this my answer is going to probably sound so trite to so many people but really truly take an afternoon at some point early i mean early not i'm not talking five years in take take an afternoon you got to find yeah you know people complain about attorneys and so on yeah i mean we all know those jokes (laughs) a good attorney is worth their weight in gold you got it. But the hard part is finding that good attorney, mm-hmm. you know, who who's going to take a real pragmatic perspective on your business. Yep. You're probably going to want somebody that deals in the startup uh, in the startup space. Right. Somebody that understands that. Yep. Uh, and then there's there's going to be some nuances around your specific product and, and industry that you're probably going to want to pay attention to. So so trying to find the right attorney um is hard that's that's the hard part to me once you once you feel good about your your attorney and you know what you just do that through recommendations that's the only way you can do it you know i mean it's the only way you can get to somebody good is through through recommendations but once you have that attorney sit down for an afternoon you know you're talking three or four or five hours and just hammer out a structure that you feel good about that the attorney thinks is is solid like whether you're putting it into a separate entity maybe you're putting it into a, a separate entity that's a different formation than your yeah. operating company yeah, there's there's some things that you can do but a good attorney will just walk you through all that mm-hmm. and really to me what a good attorney does is it the good attorney gives you the the sort of pros and the cons yeah around decisions and then you make the decisions and then they just walk you down the path and then you end up in a in a good spot then at the end of that day you know hopefully it's just one day uh one afternoon at the end of that day you look at the attorney you say hey let's let's we're done go draft this up the way we just talked about it and then they'll bring it back to you You probably have to take a couple hours a few weeks or a month later read it make sure you understand it and then execute on that and the thing the thing that I am amazed. I mean, the thing is so important is that you understand what you set up. Right. Right. And, and I know that sounds so simple, but I know 
There's a lot of people out there that start companies and, and attorneys put documents in front of them and, and they don't understand what the heck it is that they're, that they're signing. And that, you know, was one of the things that, 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 my, that I always did is one of the things that I sort of brought to our partnership is I would read these documents. <laughs> you know, I'm no lawyer. I would read them and, Oh, I would do, I would. And I'd ask the dumb questions to the lawyer, you know, like, I don't understand what this means. I just don't understand. And, and they, they tell you, and, and so that's it. That's how I would approach IP. Don't put a ton of time into it. Yep. Get enough, nice rough structure around it, put it in place, understand it, and then move forward. And then move forward. Yeah, I like that. And uh yeah, I, I definitely like that. Yeah, it was it was one situation I had where it seemed like it was a startup company, it was kind of three people, and two of them had maybe broken off, and but the trademark was in like the the, the one person's name who it was three people, and if two broke off, you have this say person A and then B C broke off, it was in person A's name, so they're kind of contacting me. I'm like, oh, so can we use the, the trademark? And I'm like, ah, well. <laughs> it's not in the Maybe company not. name and it's not in your guys's name so it's in person's a name and if you use it you're you know they can, that person they can come after you uh but i guess to your point hey if they would have just sat down with an attorney and an attorney could at least kind of explain to them what that meant then you know maybe they were okay with it but again i'm always and it seems like you're of a similar vein as far as just kind of being informed of what these these different things mean and that's okay with you then that's okay with you uh but it seems like they definitely weren't informed and that kind of took them off guard and and it was well, like, that happens like, it happens all the time really you know and, and and that's more of a broader legal stuff it's not necessarily yeah. ip related but yeah. you know um and i know like i know i'm really simplifying all that and if you're in the if you're in you know if you're an engineer and you've developed something like there's a level of complexity around intellectual property that i don't even i can't even you know look i can't even think about it's too complex right but you know that i'm talking about from a pretty simple simplistic yeah. Yeah. standpoint Oh, yeah. And, and it's still important stuff. Like you said, uh, you know, everybody, man, it, if you do things right, then the, the, hopefully the company grows and this intellectual property is worth more and just kind of having kind of it maybe being structured or a general structure in place would, would, uh, would, would definitely help out. Uh, I, I guess you're, you're a big reader. I, again, reading the book growth uh, or grow, you, you, you kind of reference a number of other, uh, a number of other books in there. Uh, and, and again, our big reader. So how, how important is that as a business owner or entrepreneur, as you're trying to grow your business, uh, how important is it to read different books? And again, it, it, it sounds straightforward, but one school of thought is almost, okay, yeah, definitely read and, 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 and get as much information from successful people who have kind of done things at scale. Then the, the other part is almost, or the other side of the coin is, just take action. And I know sometimes I have an issue with trying to balance. Do I just try to take all the, take in all this extra additional information to kind of help me out with kind of maybe growing a business? Cause I, cause I, I have some real estate and do I some, do some other things outside of law. So do I maybe try to get some information to, from these other people who have done it at a high level to help me kind of grow the business or do I just take action and not so, uh, not worry about so much the, the just kind of the read and read and read. And how, how do you kind of balance that? Cause it seems like, again, you, kind of reference a number of other books and authors yeah. in your book grow yeah i i don't think those are competing okay so i believe in taking action oh. you know i do I, I believe like you know i've been doing it for 28 years you know like like there are times when people in our organization will just you know they're they're sort of overwhelmed by my partners and my ability to just make a decision yep. a massive decision and just plow forward you know yep. uh and but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be reading and and reading and here's my here's my point i make and and grow or one of them is you got to read deeply you know yep. it, it it is amazing to me that people flip through and read a two minute excerpt from something and think they understand it and or people will read the first two chapters of, of a book and set it down and think well i i got this book i understand it. I, you know i don't need because you know most authors i know <laughs> i shouldn't say it like that like I, it's not like i know 100 authors you know but <laughs> but like like my, i my premise is that authors leave some of the best stuff yep. for the end of the book you know, they're, they're making their, their more powerful points at the end of the book. And, and that may not be true, but, um, and you know, are you going to like, 
you go to the you go to a cocktail party and you meet some entrepreneur who's been successful for two or three years and has built a business and and they're uh they're doing pretty well for themselves and they're going to give you advice right yeah you shouldn't listen to that person right they don't know shit they've started one company that kind of was successful right i want you reading peter Thiel. i want you reading fred deluca i want you reading elon musk i want you reading i mean i want you reading the people that are truly and by the way when when peter Thiel or or elon musk or when these people write books they're putting their best stuff down on those yep. words, on those pages. Like, and they think of the heart about it. Like, what is the arguments? What do they believe? So, you know, people will go to a cocktail party and meet somebody who's, you know, built a nice business for themselves over the last five years. And, you know, that they, they'll listen to that person. Like that person knows what the hell they're talking about. And it's like, <laughs> they don't know shit. They don't, I mean, they got, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that, but they don't know what Elon Musk knows or yep. they don't know what, you know, the, the guy from the Mavs, the guy that owns the Mavs, what's his name? Mark Cuban. Uh, yeah. This guy's amazing. You know, like you should read every freaking thing you can get from Mark Cuban or, yep. or who's the guy, uh, God, my brain is not working. The, he's brilliant. Oh man. Um, cool. anyway, you know what my point is, there's really, really, really smart, really, really, really successful people out there that have put a ton of effort into a book. Read that, right? Sure. Have a nice cocktail conversation with yep. the, with somebody on a Friday night at a party, right? Fine, whatever. But where you want to be learning is this, you know, this stuff that like, I mean, I wrote my books, man. And I, I mean, I swear, I just tried to be as honest as I possibly could with What's the mentality need to take to be successful in starting a business? That's it. So right or wrong, you know, <laughs> right or wrong. I really tried hard to, to do that. And, you know, do you want to be reading that or do you want to be talking to the person who, you know, put a couple of pizza shops together and, you know, sure, they've, they've done all right. But and, and, and I'm with you on that. Uh, it, it, and it seems like, again, people have have different philosophies on it and because even what you said about okay reading a couple chapters and thinking you know the whole book a lot of people take that approach of okay we're going to skim the book and not kind of really read the book and kind of see you know what all of it saying all of the glory and and, and maybe read a couple chapters and and kind of think they have it figured out as it relates to at least that book or the essence of the core or the core of that book which uh I, again I, I i like i said i personally struggle with sometimes because you you, you hear these competing things of okay just, you don't have to read the entire book. Just skim a couple chapters and get the essence of it and uh, kind of go from there. But it's this other school of thought of, no, I'll read it, especially if it's somebody who's been extremely successful, such as yourself, such as Elon Musk or a Mark Cuban. You know, read their biography or whatever the case may be and kind of see how they really did it as opposed to just trying to skim some chapters. And uh, So let me ask you this. Go let ahead. me ask you this. Do you think that one of the receivers – in that football game last night, skim that playbook prior nope. to the game? No. That's a good point. They were so deep into that. I mean, I know, I, I personally know uh, a wide receiver who plays in the NFL. He reads it. He has his dad read it to him mm. every week. And they are deep, right? So... I, I t I'll tell you, I don't, I mean, success to me, successful leaders, successful entrepreneurs, maybe, maybe there's some out there that skim shit. I don't know many. I mean, huh. I like you know that. what I mean? Like, and, and I'm fortunate. I don't know a ton of super successful entrepreneurs, but I know some, you know, and, and they're dead fucking, sorry. They're are dead. You going, you going they're dead serious, man. Yep. I mean, they, they are deep and they don't, they're not skimming stuff, you know? Uh, and, and so I think, I don't know what this mentality and, you know, and it, and I, I skimming is also scrolling. Yep. People that get their information through scrolling, man, that's entertainment. Let me be really clear. You, when you're scrolling your phone on LinkedIn or whatever the heck it is, that stuff is entertainment. There, there's, there's, there can be value in some articles, you know, maybe to get you thinking a certain way, but there's no 
deep thinking going on there. Right. You know. Just the, definitely just the highlight reel, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> right. Definitely the highlight reel. No, and, and and you had mentioned in in Grow, which uh, I watch every year. Uh, you mentioned the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the uh, uh, J.P. Morgan's. I watch the Men Who Built America. I'm not sure if you have seen that on. I think it's on Amazon Prime. I'm, I watch it every year just to kind of get it understand or to kind of recalibrate things. These guys are thinking big in their respective industries back then, and literally built industries from the ground up. And yeah. And when you talk about kind of just learning from the best, uh, I, I know you mentioned those three names in a book, and I, I thought that was pretty cool because, like I said, I watched that The Men Who Built America like every yeah. year, and that's just kind of seeing those guys' stories are, uh, yeah, that's amazing. So, no, no, that, that's pretty cool. Do, do you think entrepreneurship is for, like, like everybody can participate in it, or do you think it's for a, a subset of, like, a personality type, whether you're an extrovert as opposed to an introvert or uh, do you think everybody can participate in uh, entrepreneurship? Because I guess to be honest with you, uh, Mike, I, I, I think the time now is getting more interesting with the AI and everything that's going on. And obviously we can kind of use AI to our good. But I think it's, I don't know, and I can be completely wrong on this where uh, it, 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 it seems like just kind of you, your, your brand, your personality, and it's going to be more important than ever as, as a differentiator between, okay, AI and like a real person and a real brand, if if, if you will. So I, I guess, and I think an entrepreneurship, it, like you said, it takes that that business takes on the form of the leader, uh, much like Bigby has done with with yourself and Bob. Uh, so do you think everybody can kind of participate in this entrepreneurship uh, 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 realm, if you will? Yeah, I absolutely do, and, and and I do. And here's 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 the way I approach that. And if and if there's you know if there's probably the primary criticism I've gotten around grind anyways, is that it sounds like I'm trying to convince people not to become an entrepreneur because of, you know, it's too hard or it's too this or it's too that, or, you know, well, the thing is the first chapter of grind is due diligence on you. So, and it isn't about whether you can or should or shouldn't become an entrepreneur. It is knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are so that you can complement your strengths and supplement your weaknesses. That's, that's what it's about. I, I, I mean, I know some of the most successful entrepreneurs that, that really aren't extroverts. They're not gregarious. They're not, and they understand that about themselves. And then they take action to, to supplement that need in their business or, you know, and so that to me, the self-awareness around how you as the leader impact the organization and impact the business so that you can lead with that awareness and understand it, that's what's critical, period. And nobody comes to a business with a full toolbox. Yep. Everybody's got weaknesses. Everybody, you know, like I'm sure there's people that hear my little bit on reading and are like, you know, I've got ADHD. I've never read a book in my life. It's like, yeah, I know. Like, I, you know, it, 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 everybody has their, everybody has their, their issues, you know, uh, their strengths and their weaknesses and so on. It's about how we deal with those. And I think that entrepreneurship is about creating value in the world. And, you know, we do, we do, we create value in the world and people are willing to pay for that value. That's, and I, I mean, I think most people can figure that out, you know, like in a, in a, in a way it, it's about, it's about problem solving. It's about solving a problem, bringing value. And when you approach it from that perspective, uh, as long as you're solving a real problem in the world, people are going to be willing to pay for that. I like that. I definitely like that. And, and 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 you do it in a unique way. And I know we're kind of approaching the hour and I want to be respectful of your, your time. But I, I guess I've never, because you you hear about it, and you're like totally against this, where you hear the people say work 16 hours, 16 hours a day or work a weekends and all those things. And you have a completely different approach to it, so much so that I, I get read the book and recall one time where somebody's father called you and kind of were. Yeah. I got just try to give you stuff about kind of telling their son or, or, or whatnot that it, you shouldn't be telling them that if he wants to be successful, he shouldn't be working on a night and night, night and weekends. Uh, I guess what, where did that approach come from? Because, you know, heck, uh, Hey, it, it definitely has worked for you to the, to the tune of kind of building big be franchise and to 
what it is today. Uh, I, I guess, but and this seems like something that you're 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 really really adamant about. Uh, you kind of maybe Very talk a little bit about that. Well, a couple things. Um, and I know I'm deep into sports and football references today. Uh, but you know, if the NFL thought that, or if a team thought that making their players practice eight hours a day on the field, be in the gym for two hours, watch tape for four hours. If the NFL team thought that that would give them a better chance of winning, they'd be doing it. Right. Period. Right. Like, you know, they would be, they'd be, if, if they thought that practicing 12 hours a day would help them win, they would do it. Yep. They don't. Right. You cannot perform at a high level, in my opinion, 10, 12 hours a day. Mm. I don't think you can even perform at a high level like eight hours a day. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, it's like, it's about, it's about a car. Like, here's another analogy a car. If that car's always redlined, always driving as fast as it can drive, it's got no ability to surge, it's got no ability to maneuver, right? And so you want to drive the car with the within the the bandwidth, right, where you have the ability to accelerate or decelerate. Or and so I look at I look at work that way too. If I'm always going as hard as I can go, and then oh shit, some crisis hits, yeah. then I got no ability to go harder. I've got no ability to to. And so it's knowing when to work hard. And believe me, believe me, you know, you yeah. know, I've worked. We, I've worked hundred hour weeks in my career. You don't no get to where you are without, without working. So, you know, I, I have worked really, really hard at moments in my career, but there's, I can't, you can't do that all the time. And so you got to have the 25 or 30 hour week to balance the 80 hour week. And so, you know, that's, that's my point. Uh, you know, and it's knowing when to work hard. That's the key. Got it. All right, and that 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 makes perfect sense. I guess maybe a fight, a couple fighter questions for you. Have you ever? And obviously, this would have been a long time ago. Kind of starting out Big B Coffee, and seems like I know sometimes I'm kind of working in kind of the things that I'm doing, and I just kind of think to myself, uh, what what am I doing this for? I can be doing something else. I can. I mean, I have a kind of a cushy attorney job. I can just kind of do. What am I doing this extra stuff for? Uh, just trying to kind of breakthrough if you will uh did, did you ever have those moments uh i guess back then starting out with big i know things were extremely difficult at times and you talk about the boogeyman and and and, and being prepared for that uh that that thing uh but has you have you ever kind of have been going through things at some point uh in the operation of the the, the company and just thought to myself ah, i can go back to sales and make some decent money and yeah, it's going to be tough but it's not going to be kind of dealing with the bs that i'm Kind of having to deal with right now because it seems like every entrepreneur kind of has that at, at, at some point and i guess if you did how kind of did you overcome or kind of make sense of it to keep going yeah so uh it's a good question you know um i i don't sure i'm not sure this answer is going to make sense but what i've always done is i've always treated my work like it's a game and I have to make the right decisions and the right moves today in the game. And when you're playing a game, it's interesting. It's fun, you know? Uh, and so, so I, I don't, you know, I can't really say, and I know this sounds Pollyannish, but I don't know that I've, I really had moments where I didn't want to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, there's been hard times but that's all been part of the game yeah. you know like like you understand when you approach it that way that you know if you go out and you're playing a game of tag there's moments you're gonna have to run yeah. <laughs> you know it's gonna be <laughs> you know and and you're gonna have to boogie and you're gonna have yeah. to go you know and uh and so you know that that's that's kind of like the way it goes for me and i understand when there's hard moments that it's not I've never, ever thought that this thing would crash and burn and not work. I've always believed that it's going to work. And, and so when you have that belief that it's going to work in the end, 
in how magical it's going to be when it works. Yeah. You know, like it's pretty magical right now. Yeah. It's pretty magical what I get to do and how I get to live. And, and it's going to be more magical in 10 years, you know? And so, yeah. and I believe that in my soul. And so then you, and that's all that, that's the whole chapter and grow about optimism. The, the power and importance of optimism it's all worth it in the end you know and uh and so to me that's that's how i've always approached my my work and my life frankly the other piece is it's about waking up in the morning and having interesting things to do hmm. that's it yeah. and i get to do that and even when it's super challenging it's interesting you know it's interesting <laughs> and so we have stuff that happens that it's hard and and, and difficult but you know what it's not boring that's for sure <laughs> then i guess the final question that i get you out of here on is what do you say to those people because it again in the latest book that that, that seems to be more so kind of geared toward okay you're trying to get to okay the, the company is successful it's, it's profitable you're trying to get to, to sustainability uh but for those who are out there who are saying hey I'm an entrepreneur or I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and okay, maybe I don't necessarily want to kind of get my business to a hundred million or 250 million and kind of deal with the ins and outs of having to run a big company. Uh, but I, but I, I just want to do okay for myself. Uh, I, you know, I want to be able to, uh, make a nice living, be able to prepare, uh, take care of my family. Uh, I guess have the freedom of my time, whatever that means. Uh, uh, and they, they say, okay, so, so my, what do you have for me? Uh, is it kind of is that do you tell them hey that's the wrong way to approach it because again we talked about earlier when you when you say uh just trying to improve and uh, a byproduct of a improving it's kind of the growth so if you're not growing then you ultimately are kind of going to die uh which <laughs> i guess that's kind of tough to put it like that but it no, is, what it is. so yeah. do, do you tell them hey you need to always be growing or is it a, a way for those people who don't want to have this massive company or a big company have to deal with all these employees and things like that that they can kind of still kind of heed some advice and kind of be successful as a, a entrepreneurship or a solopreneur uh, without those kind of grand goals or, or, or dreams. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. You know, um, that's just not my mentality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really, I, I, my brother and I were joking, we were down in Florida, you know, and there are these guys that owned a, company that would scrape the bottom of boats you know uh, whatever in the salt water you gotta clean the bottom yep. of boat constantly yep. you know and so um uh and i'm like man that would be a nice business you know like we pull up you got your coffee you put your wetsuit on you climb under the boat you clean the bottom of the boat you get up you go home like that and my brother looks at me and he goes yeah but you know within two years you'd have five teams you know, within, within, you know, five, 10 years, you'd have like a company that was, you know, had invented some new chemical to put on the bottom of boats so shit wouldn't grow on. You know, he's like, he's like, you could never just show up and clean the bottom of a boat, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and so I'm just a little bit, I'm wired a little bit differently that way. Um, I think, but I, I think the, the way that being better at something does not necessarily, I guess, have to mean growing huge. Mm -hmm. yep. like. Like you could just focus on getting better and better and better at servicing your clients. And, you know, probably growth is going to happen uh, if that, if, cause you know, that's the way that the world works. Right. Um, but you know, you, you, you could put things in place where it's like, no, like I'm, I'm going to cap my, my, my client list at, at 70 and done. And I'm just going to then get really good at servicing those 70 people. And, right. and, and that would be, you know, I, I understand that, you know? Um, so, but if I'm being honest, I can't, it's a hard question for me to answer. Yeah. Just not really wired that way, you know? And, and, I'm, I'm, and if I have a free, free, I'm going to try to fill it with something, you know, and my, it, you know, much to my wife's chagrin, you know, I'm always in the trying to, I'm always diving into something new and different <laughs> and trying to grow it. And, and it's just exciting. Yeah. No, and, and, and that's cool yelling. I guess the same way I kind of look at things before I start something, I kind of look at myself or look at it and say, okay, can, can I scale this thing? And I, I guess that's kind of one of the things I always look at when I'm looking at something. It seems like, like you said, it's, it's almost like, that. okay, if I have to just do this on a on a regular, not necessarily even a regular size or regular scale or just small, that's it's almost kind of you're wired to look at 
big picture, uh, you know, just kind of a big thinker and and how to how to get how to get the most out of something, which uh that's yeah, that that's that's that definitely seems like the way I'm uh, wired as well. It seems like I I'm not sure. I, I would imagine that some people out there are just kind of more so I just kind of want to I don't want to say do the bare minimum, but just kind of want to have my small maybe restaurant or a couple of restaurants and kind of right off into the sunset. So I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that on whether or not that was a I guess a good approach uh, to things or not. Yeah, you know, but running a restaurant or two restaurants, like that's not easy either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we all know that's true. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's no matter what size your business is, you got issues, you know, that yep. you're dealing with. And, uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like picking your issues. Like what are the issues you want to deal with? And, uh, um, but you know, one of the things I miss is being with the customer, you know, being with the mm -hmm. consumer walking in the store. I don't get to do that anymore. And that was one of my favorite things in the business, you know. And so I could see being pretty gratified with that, you know, being being a big part of your life. Like that would be cool. Yep. Yep. No, that's yep. And so where where can they get the books? I know I I, I got the the, the the grow, which you know, I know you're recording the audible, which is the latest book. I, I did get that on Amazon and uh the grind I was able to get. I have an audio books account, so I was able to get the, the audio version there. Uh, is it any other place that they can get the grow book as well as the grinding? Both are amazing books. I uh, did get a chance to finish them before we uh, had this uh, 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 interview today, and they I, I recommend both of them. Uh, so, is it any other place they can get them besides maybe Amazon or the yeah, audio, audio bookstore? They're pretty much everywhere. Books are sold, um, Amazon, and and, uh, and the audio version of Grow is not done. I'm I'm still chugging through that. That's uh, that's tedious, but. Um, yeah, so pretty much anywhere, and then and then the best place to to reach me is through my my website, uh, michaeljmcfall.com, and then uh, and then you know through the social medias too. We monitor those pretty closely, and um, I'm I'm not personally that engaged in it, but 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 we are, <laughs> we are. You know, I I get all, I get any anytime somebody makes a comment or sends me a note, I get it. You know, I do get those. So no, yeah, and I I definitely appreciate the time. I appreciate. Again, just kind of reading my uh my 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 message and kind of agreeing to, to do the interview. Uh, again, sure. I know we had talked about it. I try to kind of take things from people who have done things at a, a at a high level and see what I can implement into what I'm doing to have you know that type of success as well. And uh, again, you know, with your situation, it, it, it was great. Number one, because again, Baby has been wildly successful. But number two is. I actually love the product as well. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Like two boxes for me to be able to get a chance to do this, and uh, I know just kind of trying to be respectful of your time and kind of keep it at around an hour or whatnot. I, but I, I definitely appreciate the time and uh, just thanks for giving me. the audience some uh, some 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 nuggets because I think yeah. you definitely dropped a lot of them, and uh, I'll definitely be uh, rewatching this as well. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, I, I love to, uh, I love to talk about this. This is my passion. It's what I love to do. Definitely. Definitely. Well, all right, audience, with that being said, we, until next time, see you later.